Hello and welcome to this advanced practice issue of the Critical Care Practitioner podcast. In this episode, I'm going to talk to those working at advanced practice level or those who are in the training pathway to do so to find out some of their insights into the role and the advice that they can offer. Let's go. Welcome to the Critical Care Practitioner podcast. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Jonathan Downham and I'm an advanced critical care practitioner over here in the UK. And I'm very glad to be joined today by Gareth Ward. Gareth, can you start by just telling us who you are and where you work? So uh, my name is Gareth Ward. Um, I'm a trainee advanced clinical practitioner, literally in the last part of my master's, um, and I work three days a week in primary care, and I also work one day a week for the CCG training hub in Wiltshire. Okay, and what's, so what's I'm your a background, background, Gareth? Background. Um, so qualified um, at Bournemouth University back in 2011. Um, stayed in the ambulance service to 2018 um, and did my ECP course. And then that's when I jumped into primary care and started my master's program. And why the jump into primary care? Was that something you'd always hankered after or did just an yeah, opportunity come across Yeah, well, when, when I did my emergency you? care practitioner course at UWE, um, we had to do a placement um, in primary care and I, I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed the kind of generalism that it, that it shows um and the the uh, the kind of autonomy that goes with it and, and i think that was a big decider for me because we we're at a stage where the ambulance service were removing some of our specialist paramedics um who had advanced roles extended skills and we we're going back to an old model of a paramedic and an ambulance um with some governance that unfortunately was quite restrictive so i thought at that time that my aim point was always to go into advanced practice and the opportunity arose and then i went into it Okay, so I mean, the next question, you've almost answered it anyway, but why advanced practice for you? Why not? I mean, was it just a frustration with the paramedic service as a whole or was advanced practice something that you wanted to do anyway? Yes, I always always enjoyed learning and I enjoyed, you know, providing enhanced services to patients. And I think um, my plan was always to go into um, into like an advanced practice clinical role, um, and like I, like, like I said, with the ambulance service removing the specialist paramedic role, um, and my placement being in primary care, and I think in the ambulance service you only did a proportion of that patient's journey, and you, ne- you didn't necessarily find out the outcome. And the thing that's really exciting about advanced practice mm. and working in primary care is you can see whether your working diagnosis was correct, and you can also utilise pathology and other bits to to kind of ascertain exactly what's going on. So the learning is constant. Okay, so just tell me a little bit about the training journey to become an advanced practice in uh, primary care. What, what 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 kind of pathway do you have to go so through to achieve that? I went through a master's apprenticeship, which was fully funded, um, and it gives you 20% protected study time. So at the time I started, I had twins that were less than a year old, and I was really worried about how I was going to do my master's study as well as kind of, you know, progress and, and also be a good dad. So that protected study time was absolutely pivotal. Um, so it was um, a modular approach. Um, but the, the, other, the other advantage of uh, the apprenticeship program for myself was that the, the camaraderie, because you stay with the same cohort the whole time, um, and it was such an array of different backgrounds. So mm. there's a lot of people from secondary care working like ambulatory care, working in kind of big plastics departments and um, going right out to people in the community in primary care. So it, it was really good for networking. But I think, um, you know, a, a real advantage of, it, of the masters is that it's, it's funded and we all know how expensive that can be. Um, but there's other routes into it. You know, people, mm. some people choose to do a modular approach and do it at their own pace and, and just kind of pick and choose modules that are there. But with the recent governance and standardization that's trying to happen in primary care, so we're all acting above the same, the same hymn sheet as such. Um, because when you start looking at, like, for an A&E example, they have like the RECM models and, and aspects where in primary care, we've never really had that governance, whereas um, the Centre of Advanced Practice, I'm hoping, will start to provide that for us. Okay, so you are, what are you, yep, based so in a GP, GP practice, practice, are you? Um, and um, predominantly doing urgent same-day assessments, so managing duty clinics, um, so telephone triage, bringing them in, dealing with pathology, 
Um, and I also do a bit of, of training because the GP surgeries are spending a lot of money for resuscitation training. So they quickly realise that actually, why are we outsourcing this when someone can do it internal? So um, I've been doing bits like that as well. Mm. Okay, excellent. So you're you're seeing the full range of patients as they come in. Presumably, you are um, working at differential diagnoses and moving on to treatment yeah, and then absolutely. follow up of these and, patients. Um, and, and that's what I really, really love. You know, some people get excited by trauma and whizzing around in helicopters, but I, I think for me personally, getting that first onset of an abdominal complaint and then being able to get that complex history to ascertain lifestyle to then go on and do pathology requesting. And if, if appropriate, we can request ultrasounds and imaging and then to get all them results back and to kind of put treatment plans in place. I've, I'm really, really enjoying the, you know, using my brain. And how do you think that the uh, experience of being a paramedic actually so I think being a paramedic, this. we're very, very good at structured patient assessment um, because very much from no onset sort of training, you mm. were very much driven into the patient assessment ABC. Um, and also as well, it's just that experience of kind of closing cases and discharging people on scene. So your safety netting is is very good and you get quite used to lone working. And when you take that into, into primary care, is that you've got that confidence to safety net. You've got that experience of unfortunately seeing people blowing their last. So you, you get that kind of um, pattern and that intuition that, you know, when someone walks in and they're pale and clammy that they don't look very well or the opposite now in primary care when someone's tw- 20 or comes in with chest pain and they kind of run in a room quite happy. You've got that intuition there. Um, and... Um, I think as paramedics, mm. we're quite generalist in, in, only in the fact is that we don't really get a choice in what we see. You, you know, you, your pager goes off and off you go and you have to deal with it. And um, certainly looking at other colleagues, some of them might be restricted by seeing pregnant people or under six, whereas I think paramedics are quite flexible because of that training and that experience approach. And that's something that we can bring to primary care. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I would imagine your paramedic training is probably invaluable. And it, it does sound to me like, um, for example, the resuscitation training, you've got lots of skills to bring in there as well. And like you say, as a paramedic, often you're kind of out there on your own, aren't you? At least if you're in a GP practice, if you find something that stumps you a little bit, you've got your colleagues yeah, to call on as well. Yeah, I the two surgeries that I've worked at now, they're, they've been amazing. And um you know, the GPs are really approachable. And that's, to be honest, that's been the best part of the training, really, is that you can get all the different modules and the pathophysiology modules, etc. But sometimes it's a little pearls of wisdom that the GPs can provide just to kind of instill that that confidence. And um, yeah, it is, it's, it's been really valuable. Okay. Are you uh, the only advanced practitioner in your so practice or are there this, others this, as well? well? Primary care is predominantly dominated by nurses and um, certainly within my primary care network, which is what we're starting to happen in the communities now where groups of surgeries work together but with shared assets. Um, so we have predominantly, it's, it's nurse practitioners. I'm the first one to go in as an advanced clinical practitioner into that PCM. So just explain the difference sure. between so, the nurse practitioner and your role. Very in all honesty. Just, we just have different registrative bodies. So the AMPs and the as working together, um, as you know, I don't think necessarily patients would know the difference because we've both got different assets. Like I said, so, um, mm. some of the nurses um, are a bit governed by what they can do. For example, the NMC in pregnant ladies with urinary tract infections. Um, and some people um, with a nursing background aren't happy seeing paediatrics. But I think as a whole, we can... We really bounce off well as a team and there's plenty of stuff that we, we missed out in our training, such as chronic wound care and all that stuff that they can be really, you know, really pivotal for me because it's something that I've never done before. Mm, well, you're welcome to leg ulcers as far as I'm concerned. So um, they were nev- never my favourite thing, I'm afraid. So just to move on a little bit, and um, I do feel your pain with the twins. I've got twin boys as well. They're um, they're both 18 now, so they've moved on a little bit further than yours. But I was certainly doing my advanced practice whilst my twins were very small as well. So um, you, you learn to work around it, don't you, you know, and uh, just uh, have some structure to your life and hopefully... Uh, get down to work when you can that was certainly my approach what was your biggest struggle during your training you think other than trying to manage twins as well I think the biggest struggle for me um, was that when we start looking about GPs and doctors in general is that when they have time as med student and the same with the nurses 
they are lucky enough to spend different placements in different specialities and whether that's in a community whether that's in hospital and they rotate around these specialities and and um, as paramedics we never had that so our training was predominantly emergency care focused understandably but there's specific gaps in knowledge so all of a sudden when you're going into a gp surgery and you're seeing an otitis externa and otitis media etc you're thinking I don't know at what point to, to send that on to ENT. Um, so it is, it, it's literally been that aspect. And the same with pathology, really, is that, you know, paramedics, it's not something that we did out on the road. You know, we, a lot of our emphasis was on kind of life-saving techniques, but understanding a, a D-dime or an FBC and the, and the caveats around it just isn't there for us. And that's, and that's been a massive learning curve. And Unfortunately, it's just been a few, you know, you make a few mistakes and, and then you learn from them, you know. So, for example, doing a D-dime on a pregnant lady, it's always going to come back raised. I never knew that. So I thought I was the bee's knees ordering it. And then you could just hear the consultant and ambulatory care just kind of hitting the, the desk just because they're like, why has he done that? And um, so it is a lot of learned by experience. But like I said, just, just going back, the, you know, the GPs and the nurses have got a very good training. And I think that's something that the paramedics, if they're going to come into primary care, um, maybe you know rotation around different specialities if they can identify that early on is going to be really crucial. Okay, um, if you we're just going to go for a, a little break, Gareth, and then we'll continue talking after that. Are you working in critical care, or are you quite new to critical care? Are you working through the ICU Steps program, for example? then I've got something that I think can help you over on my Podia site. I'm going to be releasing very soon Respiratory Care of the Critically Ill Patient over on Podia. In this course, you'll learn about the anatomy and physiology of the airway. You can learn about intubation, why we do it, and how we do it and the equipment involved. I'll be teaching you about chest x-ray interpretation, acid-based balance and arterial blood gases. And in the mechanical ventilation section, we'll be talking about the physiological effects of ventilation, what the numbers mean on the ventilator screen. We'll talk about SIMV, we'll talk about ARDS and proning, and many other issues involved in mechanical ventilation. We'll also talk about the insertion of chest drains and how we look after them once they're in, and when we take them out. You can also learn about tracheostomy. What are the indications for tracheostomy? The types of tubes we use, how we humidify the tracheostomy, and tracheostomy red flags. All this teaching will come as a series of videos with quizzes in between to test your knowledge. And you'll also have access to the PDFs of the written material for you to use at your leisure. The video content alone is over seven hours of learning. So with the PDFs, Plus some of the audio content I also include, we're going to go into the respiratory care of the critically ill patient in depth, helping you become a better practitioner. If you sign up at my Podia site, which is criticalcarepractitioner.podia.com, and Podia is P-O-D-I-A, you can see this course, which I'm going to be releasing soon. So come and learn with me. Remember, as I learn, you learn too. Okay, Gareth, so we talked about some of the struggles you had and uh, the rotating around the specialties, which you think might be helpful. Um, what other advice would you have, do you think, for anyone? Because I, um, I would imagine there's a few paramedics out there who are thinking about doing a similar thing. What other advice might you have for them to make their pathway think, a little um, smoother? I think something that's um, it's an old myth on the road, really, and, and some paramedics think that people go into primary care for a bit of a break and to deal with chest infections and UTIs, but I think it's mm. about understanding the complexity of some of these patients because it's very easy in the ambulance service to go out to a patient and refer them back to their GP um, but ultimately when they then get sent back to you and you're seeing these people you start you start really thinking about what you're going to do for them so I think um, you know general reading around but also just to get involved with um, you know if there's a local surgery that's got a paramedic you know we're more than happy to have people involved and to come with us and, and to get involved and and just shadow because like I said unfortunately I've seen quite a few paramedics make the jump into primary care and they don't like the restrictions that you know because the time constraints is a really big problem um, and they end up bouncing back so try before you buy I think would be my biggest advice. 
Okay, that's good advice. What was the part of advanced practice that you found less difficult than you thought you might have done when you started? What what was a little easier? So I think when I when I went into be? primary care, and because in the ambulance service you're not really governed by time, you could spend an hour with a patient if you wanted to. No one was really on your case. Um, and when I went into primary care to move to mm. fifteen minute appointments and. You know, this patient comes in with chest pain and they're quite complex and just seeing that list start to build up. It, initially, it was quite stressful, but actually very quickly, you're, it, it really enhanced my patient consultation skills because you were very able to do, well, very happy to do a very concise history, um, picking out the information that you needed to make that informed decision. But I think, you know, I, I really enjoy that aspect. And, you know, just and also with examinations, again, in the ambulance service, uh, when I was in there, they were very governed by policies, uh, for example, such as having to do three sets of observations before they discharged someone, including a blood glucose measure. And and just just having that autonomy to actually think, you know what, there's no we don't need to do all of that. And actually getting a really good history is 90 percent of what you're going to be doing. And the examination just kind of confirms what you're thinking. But the yeah, the. The, the primary care, the, the time constrictions can be can be quite brutal, but I, I was surprised how quickly I, I managed to get into the swing of it. And, and now my consultation model is working really well. Okay. And it's interesting you say that because that's something we all teach in the university is that 80% of your uh, diagnosis mm. is made from your history, isn't it? And the examination is hopefully just confirming what you already believe or clarifying and send you in one direction rather than the other. So uh, <laughs> it's good to hear that, that uh, we're not teaching people to do the wrong things. We're hopefully teaching them to do the right things. So, yeah, uh, I mean, no, it sounds I'm, like you love I'm your job now. I'm really passionate about, um, about one AHPs into moving into these areas that have predominantly been dominated by doctors and nurses. And, and also the the fact that they're embracing it as well mm. and and you know we're getting physios that are employed in primary care we're getting social prescribers and whereas before 10 years ago it was your doctor and your nurse now we're getting all these different allied healthcare professionals coming in and and it's a really really good place to work you know sometimes there's a lot of you know it can be very very busy but the the camaraderie between the teams is really good and it's such a good learning environment you know when you're working alongside gps with years and years of practice and the little pearls of wisdom that they can teach and an aspect it's it's a really wonderful environment to work in that is a massive you get a lot of weekends off i enjoy my football so i am i'm (laughs) over the moon because on a tuesday i don't finish any later than half past six so i can get the evening kickoffs and i'm available weekends so yeah absolute Excellent. So uh, work-life balance becomes a little bit easier then, doesn't it? Okay, so let's assume that um, you um, are going to be interviewing somebody to coming into primary care in an advanced clinical practitioner role. Um, what question would you like to ask I think the thing that's them? really important is the question I would ask them is, what does advanced practice mean to you? Because there's so many different analogies and kind of people's perceptions of what they think advanced practice is um i know none of them are wrong but if you're going to be hiring an advanced practitioner um and ultimately you've done a job description and person specification but sometimes people think that they're fulfilling an advanced practice role when actually they're not or likewise we get people that have got imposter syndrome mm-hmm. and will play their skills down a lot and then when you actually ask what advanced practice means to them and they kind of really off word for word it can be really, it can be really mesmerizing, and um, you know, I, and I think that's what's really important because the whole point, you know, like I said earlier, with the models that are used in hospital and secondary care, there's really good governance and standardization. Whereas when you start looking across primary care, because all of them are little businesses in their own right, and it, everyone has a different setup, that there's, there's no, mm. you know, there's very little standardization, and that's something again that we're hoping to improve, but certainly. Um, you know, it's not quite there yet. So I think ascertaining from the person going into that role what they see advanced practices, I think will be a very good early indicator to see whether they'll be right for that role. Okay, so I'm going to put you on the spot. What so does advanced, advanced practice, practice mean to, to you? About using the four clinical pillars. So we've got the four clinical pillars that are very well evidenced, but there's a lot of set standards that are there. And it, it's about that decision making and that autonomy is really, really important. Um, and some people say that prescribing makes an advanced practitioner and it doesn't because being able to prescribe a medicine doesn't make you advanced. It's an, another arsenal, you know, it's another bow to your, um, arrow to your bow, sorry. But ultimately, 
not prescribing anything can just be as, as an advanced decision as to not. So it's about the enhanced patient assessment. It's about taking them complex histories and actually taking a seat back and analysing all the information that's in front of you to make a to make a decision. And we have to remember as well is that it's not all about clinical because there's loads of people that I mentor and they'll say, I'm really, you know, I feel like I'm really on top of my game clinically. But when it comes to leadership, I don't feel like I'm not a manager, so I'm not a leader. And you say, well, but you're leading by example. You know, you're, you're doing these patient assessments on your own. You're coming with complex plans on your own. Importantly, you're mentoring other people as well. So when you go and help the healthcare assistant or when you go and help with a nursing associate. And it's about having that breadth of knowledge that you might not be, you know, literally 25 split between all of them. But having that awareness and the crossover is all is all the time because another thing is people say well I don't get I don't do research therefore you know I can't fulfill that pillar and you say to people well actually do you look at research are you able to understand it and you know I always liken it to the people on the tv ads you know they'll say eight out of ten people use dove and I say right that's great but look at their sample size and then and then you know go into into grets with it and I think that's Mm. what's really important so I think you know we, we really think advanced practice is, is purely clinical and it isn't. It's, it's about utilising all the pillars, but it's not necessarily being a manager or just being involved in research. It's about having a holistic approach to be able to take all of them factors in um, into your patient journey. Absolutely. Well done. <laughs> you did well in that interview, Gareth. Um, what resource have you found most useful I, I call it my green bible which was the um, oxford handbook of general practice and i'm sure other people I, I know they do one for emergency care and bits but it, it's been absolutely invaluable um when i was first going in um, just understanding cysts and about plans and management and stuff and um, there's some really good really good um web resources as well but if you're going to purchase one book i'd re- certainly recommend that one the oxford handbook that's one of the uh or well they call them pocket size you need fairly big pockets don't yeah, you but yeah like, I, I know the ones that you mean pocket, yeah that's, that's for sure no most definitely not and finally who do you admire most professionally you don't have to name names if you'd rather not but who do you admire I'm most say, professionally um, my i admire anyone or any kind of allied healthcare professional or nurse going into an area that's been predominantly been driven by a gp or a doctor or I mean, I always liken it to primary care, but it's the same anywhere, really. As we're getting roles that are evolving, you know, such as an occupational therapist, you know, we're getting endoscopic nurses. And I think anyone that's starting to break that barriers of, of the norm, I think is, is really admirable because it's not an easy time. When I, I joined primary care three years ago, four years ago now, sorry, when there was no paramedics in primary care, and I remember one of the doctors said, he quite openly came down to me and said, um, I don't know why we've got an ambulance driver in here. I don't, I don't understand what your role is here. <laughs> so, you know, but then, you know, <sighs> four years on, um, and I, I left that surgery, and she was absolutely gutted. But I think, like I said, is there anyone where we can kind of, you know, change and influence this advanced practice? I think it, it's absolutely admirable, and, um, you know, the likes of yourself, what you're doing in, in intensive care and exactly like your, your footer said on your website is that actually you're doing stuff that doctors used to do. And that's amazing, isn't it? That one, they've got the trust in us to do it. And secondly, that we can show the competence that, that we can do it as well. And I think that's really great. Yeah. And a conversation I was having earlier is um, how do you get people on side who are a little bit like that GP you just mentioned? And for me and the discussion we were having was uh, you do that through your actions by proving your worth um, and becoming invaluable. Um, and then, you know, eventually the consultants I work for say they wouldn't work without advanced critical care practitioners now. And I dare say the, con- the, the doctors you work with are of a similar feeling as well now that they've found that you provide such yeah, value no, absolutely. to their practice. We're, we're very lucky. And, and exactly like you said, we've become invaluable. And, you know, I always get, uh, I always have a bit of imposter syndrome. But when they say to me, it's like, literally like having another doctor here. And I'm thinking, no, 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 don't be like that. But it's, it's, it's lovely, isn't it? It's lovely when they get comments like that. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And I'm sure I saw on Twitter recently that there was um, uh, an advanced practitioner I don't know if he, I'm not sure what his background was, that had just become a partner uh, in a general practice surgery. I don't know if you saw that. I can't remember who it was, but, um, you know, that there's no reason why things like that shouldn't happen if you're yeah, becoming no, an invaluable really part exciting. of the practice. There's a group of practices up in, um, I think it was up near Birmingham, 
Um, but no, you're entirely right. You know, they've had nurses that are able to be partners for some time, but the fact the paramedic has gone into one. And again, it's really exciting because that paramedic can feed into the running of the surgery when we know there's problems and the shortage of GPs and partners. Um, there's a real good opportunity there for people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, it's not who you are. It's what you know, isn't it? You know, and if you know stuff that somebody else doesn't, then you are going to be of great value. And it sounds to me like you found your <laughs> your little piece of heaven. It, um, I, I'm quite envious by the amount of joy I can hear in you about the job that you obviously love. So that's brilliant. You get fewer nights and weekends, which no, is marvelous. No, I don't suppose that you was do a, nights another at all, massive, do you? Um, a huge asset, you know, to primary care. I mean, it sounds like I'm on a sales pitch, doesn't it? But no nights snow weekends um yeah and <laughs> all the sport that you want and um yeah it's sensible hours i mean we, we are starting to do improved access which to be honest i don't think is a bad thing i do think we're in a in a place now where we should be offering that um and that's eight to late generally monday to friday but i think ultimately it, it's a lovely place to work and i'm very lucky the surgery that i work in devices are really supportive they're supported by learning and that's something that has been a bit unusual coming from the ambulance service because I used to be doing nights to then go to university to study during the day and they didn't support any of it, whereas here it's not even questioned. So I'm incredibly lucky. That's wonderful. Thank you for talking to me, Gareth. Um, I, I'm hoping that there are some other paramedics out there who may be inspired to come along and have a little taste session. Like you say, it sounds like it's probably important. Um, there's what sounds to me like some misconceptions uh, as to what you actually do in a general practice. I know that um, just recently, if you believe what Twitter says, that the GPs are having a bit of a tough time as well. You know, they had to change the way they work, for goodness sake. Phone consultations can't be an easy thing to do uh, because, you you know, you're going to lose a lot of those signs that you would normally be looking for. Um, so they've got nothing but admiration from me. Uh, yeah, I worked in critical care and we got you know, the fairly heavy end of COVID, but I think the GPs uh, have also suffered as a consequence as well. And uh, they've got, like I say, nothing but respect from me and anyone who works there as well. So well done, mate. Um, it's lovely to talk to you. Um, and uh, if anyone wants yeah, to get in touch with you, you're on my, Twitter, um, are you? Twitter tags, uh, 999 bus driver, which means I probably I probably should change it now. Um, yeah. It was when I started in, primary, uh, in the ambulance <laughs> service. But yeah, any questions or anything, I'm always happy to answer. And if people in the locality want to come and shadow me for a day, they're more than welcome. Excellent. Okay, Gareth, thanks for joining me and uh, hopefully we'll speak again Thank sometime in the future. You've been listening to Critical Care Practitioner. If you would like to comment on any of today's topics, find us at criticalcarepractitioner.co.uk, tweet us at CC Practitioner, find us at facebook.com slash criticalcarepractitioner or search Critical Care Practitioner on iTunes. 